The first section of this presentation is entitled What Every Orthodox Christian Should Know About the Orthodox Faith and the appendix concerns the question of the intellectualistic and speculative approach of origin. First then, what every Orthodox Christian should know about the Orthodox faith. In our previous presentations, we conducted a brief overview of one of the most difficult chapters in theology, which is origin. And I think that the difficulty that we generally have trying to understand patristic theology, orthodox theology, and trying to place someone as difficult and as controversial as Origen stems from the fact that we are not really familiar with the basic presuppositions of orthodox theology. What is orthodox theology and what makes it distinct or unique from any other theology? We had already said, by way of introduction, that whatever we study, whatever we look at, really what we are trying to discern are these theological presuppositions that distinguish orthodox theology from any other theology. So we're trying to learn these presuppositions which themselves, however, are not just a matter of thinking straight. They're not just a matter of getting the ratio, the rational aspect of yourselves, to think correctly. Because within these presuppositions are contained something very important, an ethos that's a spirit within the doctrines of the Church, within the teachings of the Holy Scriptures and the Fathers, there is an ethos to be not only learned in an intellectual way, but to be absorbed. I had mentioned to you also that a friend of mine, Metropolitan Aerotheos Vlachos, who has written many books on the orthodox way and ethos and distinctiveness, was looking for the theology that he found when he was asked to read through the writings of St. Gregory Palamas and highlight and identify Palamas's references to Gregory the Theologian. That was a turning point in his life because what he read was really quite remarkable to him. And it made him think that if this theology were written in the fourth century and again in the 14th century, somewhere this theology must still exist. Somewhere this theology that's based on a life of prayer that's um, based on the understanding that the only truly genuine sign of a healthy soul, as we've said before, is the vision of God. When he was able to meet people who actually knew theology, meaning they knew Christ, he began to see that orthodox theology is not actually a religion. Because what is a religion? What is a thriskia? A thriskia, a religion, is something that's designed to satisfy our emotional and psychological needs. A religion is what Father John Romanides used to call a neurobiological illness. It has nothing to do, nothing whatsoever, to do with the Christian faith. The teachings of our church without life are like black coals that have remained unlit. The purpose 
of the Christian life is that we might become like the creator and author of our salvation, Jesus Christ. As we said before, it's not about do's and don'ts, and those do's and don'ts are sometimes understood in different ways, but still, they're do's and don'ts. They're a system of morals, or rules, and outward forms of discipline which may be helpful in some ways, but do not constitute the essence of the Christian life. What are the central points? What are the basic presuppositions of the Orthodox faith, the Orthodox patristic faith, the faith of the fathers, which heals, which transforms our fallen nature and regenerates it and renews it and makes it like unto Christ. Let's turn for a moment then, before we go further in our patristic journey, to some of the basic presuppositions, some of the basic assumptions, pointers that contain this ethos that we're talking about. Firstly, the God of the church is the God of revelation. That means that God has revealed himself to the saints. This revelation is called theoria or theoptia, contemplation, vision of God. The saints see God in light. Just as the three disciples on Mount Tabor saw Christ in the light. Not only do they see the light, but they live in the light. We've already encountered this in none other than Irenaeus of Lyon, a spiritual grandchild of the apostles. At that point, the one who is deified, or theumenos, has no thoughts, but exists above thoughts and above the senses. This is important because in the West, as you know, it's come to be understood that the highest level of our being is reason. So, take note. Nota bene. At this point, the one who is deified has no thoughts, but exists above thoughts and above the senses. Then, he hears uncreated words and uncreated thoughts, unspeakable words, as St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uncreated means something which has no beginning and no end. The prophet or saint describes this experience by means of created words. Created words concepts, images, created words, created concepts, created images. And in this way are the doctrines made in order, on the one hand, to guide the faithful and, on the other hand, to safeguard against false doctrines. Now, when God, this is the second point, when God reveals himself as light, that light is a threefold light. God is three lights. Once upon a time, the apostle Philip asked Christ, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. John 14, verse 8. And Christ said, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. John 14, 9. Which is to say, the saints behold the threefold light of the divinity. This does not mean that they behold the light outside of themselves, but they participate 
in God. That is to say, they participate in the glory of God, in the uncreated energy of God. They understand, however, and they experience the fact that they cannot see the source from which the light comes. Therefore, they call that which they see energy and that which they cannot see essence. And they said that we participate in the energy of God, but we do not participate in the essence of God. When we say that God has essence and energy, the fathers do not understand this in a philosophical way. This is not philosophy that they are doing, even though we know that these terms exist in philosophy and they're important terms. They understand these terms in an experiential way, by experience. This is an empirical event, in other words, not speculation. It's the result of experience, not of philosophical speculation. Now, thirdly, the Holy Trinity appears in the Old Testament and not only in the New. All of the manifestations of God in the Old Testament are manifestations of the pre-incarnate Logos, who is also called the Angel of Great Counsel by the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 9.6, Septuagint. We have, therefore, the pre-incarnate Logos, who is referred to as Yahweh. He it is that is revealed. And there is God, who is called Elohim, who is hidden, concealed. And we also have Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God, or Ruach Adonai, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of Yahweh. This is the threefold light of the divinity, Elohim, Yahweh, Ruach Elohim, Ruach Adonai. In the New Testament, Yahweh is made flesh, becomes man, and reveals to us his Father and the Holy Spirit. The difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is that in the Old Testament, we have the pre-incarnate Logos, manifestations of the pre-incarnate Logos, and in the New Testament, we have manifestations of the incarnate Logos. In the New Testament, we now know clearly the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Through Christ, we know the Father without seeing him. John 14, 9. Father John Romanides used to say, the saints see the light, the threefold divine light, through the light that is through Christ, they see the light. They say they see the light of the Father without seeing the Father, and they see it while they are in the light of the Holy Spirit. The phrase is, through the light, the light, in the light. And this can be found in the empirical dogmatics of Metropolitan Hierotheos. Next is the teaching that the triune God created the world through the Logos and man, his most perfect creature, his most perfect creation. God is uncreated. The world and man are created. Adam and Eve had a soul and body, but also the grace of God. We've already alluded to this. They had personal communion with God. They spoke with God, which means they had communion and a relationship with God. They lived in the light of God, and that is natural man. That is to say, a natural man 
is one who has a body, a soul, and also the Holy Spirit. Man is not comprised of three parts. He is comprised of two parts, body and soul. But the Holy Spirit exists in both his soul and his body. This is indeed the genuine man created by God who lives in the light. Father Romanides used to say, and you know that he studied the question of the fall in great detail. This was the subject of his doctoral dissertation, which had a tremendous impact on the direction and character of Orthodox theology in Greece, which up until that time was still, as in other places, in a certain captivity to neo-Thomism. Father Romanides used to say that the fathers, based on the experience that they had themselves, interpreted how Adam lived in paradise. And indeed, St. John Chrysostom says that Adam and Eve in paradise lived as angels. Now, this fifth point that the fall of man is not simply a legal matter. It's not simply a case of disobeying a commandment. So what is it? Well, in simple terms, it's the loss of the very experience of the glory of God. The Apostle Paul, in his epistle to the Romans, says, All have sinned and have been deprived of the glory of God. Isterunde. They've been deprived of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. The King James says, fallen short. It's deprived. Being deprived of the glory of God. That is to say, the fall is the loss of the grace of God. This is spiritual death, and that is to say, after the sin, the soul and the body remained, but they lost the Holy Spirit. That is what is meant by the ancestral sin. Spiritual death, which was followed by physical death, the death of the body. The inheritance of the ancestral sin is not an inheritance of guilt as St. Augustine used to say. But it is the corruption and death which entered into man, and it is this that is transmitted from generation to generation in the birth of newborn infants. The natural man had two energies in his soul, the one his reason and the other his Nous, that is to say, rational energy and spiritual energy, respectively. By means of the spiritual energy, he would see the glory of God in paradise. And by means of the rational energy, man could describe, write down his experience. After the fall, man's spiritual energy was darkened, but not his rational energy, and he lost his communion with God because the noose was darkened. The prophets in the Old Testament strove with the help of God, and their minds were illumined, but they were unable to overcome death which is why they went down into Hades. The problem, therefore, is how to illumine the noose of man, which means the noose needs to be separated from our rational energy because, as Father Romanides used to say, the fall is the identification of our rational energy with our spiritual energy. We're confused. We don't know. We don't know the difference between rational energy and spiritual energy. We're not aware that we even have a noose. 
The prophet Moses went up to Sinai and saw with his nous, so with his spiritual energy, the glory of God. And afterwards, with his reasoning power, wrote down his experience. But he went down into Hades because he was unable to defeat death. The triumph over death came with the incarnation of God. Okay, so point number six. Christ comes assuming our mortal and corruptible body in order to overcome death and also to overcome sin and the devil. And consequently, to restore man to his state before the fall and to raise him even higher. Christ taught by means of parables, performed miracles, but he took some of his disciples up to Mount Tabor and showed them his glory. He wanted to show them that they were to follow his teaching, put it into practice in order to behold wonders, but most especially in order to see the glory of God. This is the deepest purpose of the spiritual life, for us to overcome spiritual death, that is to say, our separation from God, so that later we will overcome the death of the body. Seven, the work of salvation takes place in the church. The church existed in the Old Testament in the communion that the prophets had with the pre-incarnate Logos, but it was a spiritual church. After the incarnation, the church becomes enfleshed, that is to say, also physical. We become members of the body of Christ. On the day of Pentecost, the apostles received the Holy Spirit, and then the apostles learned all the truth. Christ told them that he would send the Holy Spirit and that he would teach them all the truth, John 16, 13. When the priest, during the divine liturgy, divides the host, meaning the consecrated bread, he says the Lamb of God is broken and yet not divided. In the church, by means of holy baptism and holy chrismation, Man becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, says St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 6.19. What does he becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit mean? It means that in his being is activated his spiritual energy. And spiritual prayer is born in him, unceasing prayer, prayer of the heart. Man's body is a temple, and just as the temple in its innermost sanctuary has its altar, so too in the depths of the heart, by means of holy baptism and holy chrismation, a holy altar is formed. And within the heart takes place an unceasing divine liturgy, in which case man is restored to his former state in paradise, and even much higher. For now, the divine liturgy takes place within him, within his very body. There is reasonable prayer, which takes place in the brain, and there is spiritual prayer, which takes place in the heart. Reaching that state constitutes the therapy of the human person. One must reach the stage in which one has inner prayer and love for God, passion for God. That is why many fathers emphasize that there are three stages in the spiritual life. The purification of the heart, the illumination of the mind, the nous, 
and deification, theosis. Just as we have in the church building the narthex, we have the purification of the heart, then we have the nave, which is the illumination of the nous, and we have the holy altar, which is theosis. Father John Romanides used to say, because he was an ascetic theologian, that the church has two aspects, the one positive and one negative. The positive aspect is Christology. That is to say, it tells us about Christ, while the negative aspect tells us about the devil and how to strive against the devil. The more one learns to fight against the devil, that is to say, the more one learns the negative aspect of the life of the church, the more one comes to know the positive aspect of the church, which is Christ. That is why man must continually strive against the devil, for in this way he learns the love of Christ. It is very important for us to know that the grace of God and the light of God come into man via his heart, and through the heart a commingling takes place. The devil is outside man and wars against him from without. That is why we say that those who have been deified know the devil, that he is outside by virtue of association with him. We live in the church in order to be healed, which means that we must pass through the states of servants, hired laborers, and reach the status of children of God, Romans 8, 16 to 17. Father John Romanides used to say that heresy is the rejection of the quote-unquote methodology that allows us to arrive at the knowledge of God. That is to say, every discipline has its method, and if you do not follow the method, you will not reach your objective. Now the method, quote unquote, to which Father John referred, is purification, illumination, theosis. When this method is rejected, then we end up speculating about God. And when one speculates about God, logic and fantasy enter in, and we end up in heresy. Father John used to say that people become heretics when there are no prophets who can teach the method of the knowledge of God. Note, however, that he was well aware of the fact that no method or technique, quote unquote, exists by which the mind, the nous, may be reunited with the heart. More about that later. Eight, that the eschatological life is not the life after the second coming of Christ. The eschatological life is not the life after the second coming of Christ, but it is the life in Christ. Some say that we shall live the eschaton following the second coming of Christ. This is wrong. In the book of Revelation, it says that Christ is the first and the last. With the incarnation of Christ, therefore, the eschaton enters history. In this way, the kingdom of God enters the world and history, and men are able to participate in the kingdom of God. When the saints see God, Theoptia, they live the eschaton, the kingdom of God. They see it now, in this very life. This is called the first resurrection. And the second resurrection will be after the resurrection of the body, after the coming of Christ. The saints see the light through deification. This is what we sing 
in the great doxology sung at the end of matins, in thy light shall we see light. We live, that is, in the light of the Holy Spirit, in purification and illumination, and we see the light. Then, point number nine. Paradise and hell exist from the perspective of man and not from the perspective of God. God did not create paradise and hell. God is light and illumines the whole universe. Created light has two characteristics. It both illumines and burns. Some are illumined and some are burnt by it. God is the uncreated light. Some participate in the light and some are burnt by it because they are not ready to accept the light. If one does not have the eyes to see the light, then one is burnt by it. When Christ would speak of hell, he would sometimes refer to it as darkness and sometimes as fire. But wherever there is fire, there is no darkness. And wherever there is darkness, there can be no fire. Which means that hell is neither darkness nor fire, as we understand darkness and fire. God loves all men, even sinners, and he sends them his grace. Those that have been healed in this life and have acquired unselfish love will see the light. Those that have not been healed will not see the light, but they will experience the light, the light of God, as fire. That is why the fire of hell is uncreated, not created. This is very beautifully depicted in iconography. From the throne of God, the light emanates and illumines the saints. And from the throne of God comes the river of fire, which engulfs sinners, which means that the river of fire is uncreated. That is why in the church we strive so that when we see God, because all of us shall see God, both sinners and righteous, God will be for us light and not hell. This takes place in Holy Communion. Those who prepare as is meet feel the light and those who do not prepare and receive unworthily are condemned. The saints in the kingdom of God will not exist in a static state as Plato used to say about happiness and also Saint Augustine but they will be in a constant state of progression or growth. Rather, there will be a continuous movement while sinners, those that have not repented, will experience a certain hardening and they will not experience this growth. And number 10, Father Romanides used to say that Christ, by his incarnation, became man and entered history. The church lives within history and sanctifies history. History will not end as such, but it will be transfigured. There are some that say, after the second coming, history will come to an end. Father Romanides used to say that this is a mistake because after the second coming, History will exist in paradise, but it will assume a different character. It will be transformed. The saints had this experience and they used their environment 
in order to express it, either in words or in iconography or in poetry. They took elements from Hebrew thought, Greek thought, and from Roman culture, but only in an effort to express revelation and not in order to create a theology. That is why the church produces culture, but is not herself culture. The purpose of the church is to guide man towards uncreated words and uncreated thoughts, but her experience is described in terms of created elements taken from the environment. In the first millennium, there was one unified tradition in both East and West, with certain minor differences, but gradually there developed in the West scholastic theology, which gave preeminence not to the nous, but to reason, logic. Those who followed this way rejected the method of the knowledge of God, which is purification, illumination, theosis. That is to say, they rejected orthodox hesychasm and confined themselves to logical speculation about God and to many false doctrines. Thereafter, the reformers appeared and rejected scholastic theology and arrived at a certain moralism. So we have on the one side the scholasticism of the Roman Catholics and on the other side the moralizing of Protestantism. The Orthodox tradition is inextricably intertwined with hesychasm, the tradition of prayer and stillness, which is the method, quote unquote, by which we may come to the knowledge of God. Father Sophroni used to say that if we pay careful attention to the Holy Scriptures, we will notice that every manifestation of God, every theophany, is preceded by prayer and stillness. So, Hesychia, prayer and stillness, is the prerequisite for man's encounter with God. Now, I realize that in identifying these 10 points, it's not possible to cover such a vast array of themes and topics in sufficient detail in a shorter space of time without raising many, many questions. But it's my hope that by highlighting the points that we've made, we might be challenged to look a little closer at the fundamentals of Christianity from a fresh and hopefully practical perspective. Now, with the benefit of what we have just said about the basic presuppositions and criteria of orthodox theology, let us again address the intellectualistic and speculative approach of Origen. When Origen is introducing his De Principis, he says we can discuss these questions, we can address these questions, because they haven't been answered by the apostles. It's like the person who says, well, when it comes to in vitro fertilization, bioethical question, fathers never said anything about that, so, you know, it's a free-for-all. You say what you think, I'll say what I think, and as Christians, we'll figure out something Christian. The fathers didn't say anything about in vitro fertilization. Yeah, it's true. They might not have mentioned in vitro fertilization. Yeah. The Bible doesn't say, in the beginning, there was in vitro fertilization. <laughs> it's true. But does that mean it doesn't address those questions? With the presuppositions that we are given by the Bible and by the Holy Fathers, are we not able to understand what the orthodox teaching of vitro fertilization is? I think we are. In other words, I'm talking about a view of revelation that is 
quote-unquote progressive. It's that view of Revelation that says we are in a better position to understand everything than St. Paul was because he was 2,000 years ago and we've had the benefit of the Holy Spirit guiding and acting, enlightening us for 2,000 years more, more than St. Paul. That's what comes from Origen and Augustine. The idea that we are better theologians, Western theologians, really do believe that they are better theologians than the fathers. But I would say this for Origen and also for Augustine, actually. I don't think that was their intention, but that's what came out of what they introduced. And we all know that the Origenists hardened the positions of Origen, and we know that the Augustinians hardened the positions of Augustine, and that's the general tendency. The followers of so-and-so tend to harden the positions of their leader. So I would say that. But when you have that view, and it's undeniably present, I mean, St. Augustine was convinced that the question of the proprium, the special character of the Holy Spirit had not been decided. After the Second Ecumenical Council, he wasn't aware that it had been decided. He thought it hadn't been decided, and he thought that there was room for debate. And so he gives his opinion. Well, that's what Origen is doing. And regarding Origen's erroneous theories, such as the pre-existence of the soul. I'm not sure that he's taking it from Scripture, as strange as that might seem. I think being so knowledgeable of Scripture, he might well justify it somewhere in Scripture. But I think you don't have to look very far in Platonism or related philosophies or Oriental religious traditions to find something like that, if not the same. And don't forget that ancient Egyptian tradition, there's something that needs to be investigated there because that's where he's living. But that Hellenistic context, that Greek context, which tells you that nothing can come out of nothing. So everything, everything pre-exists, already exists. So that was all around him. Regarding Origen's doctrine, of the apocatastasis, influenced again, most likely, by his Hellenistic cultural context. Biblically, in terms of Christianity specifically, he's making the assumption, of course, that ultimately no one will be able to resist the love of God, which you can see is a very strong argument. But at the same time, it doesn't hold in balance the fact that God doesn't impose himself on anyone. So free will is so important because without it, we could not become like God, like Christ. Origen is obviously choosing to err on the side of the love of God. And there's something similar that takes place in St. Gregory of Nyssa although it's not the same and it's not justified, the way that Nisa's apocatastasis is presented is not fair. Whereas with Origen, it seems that he errs on the side of the love of God. Not a bad thing to err on the side of, is it? So it's forgivable, but the really curious thing, if you want to get down to it, is how Origen assumes there is this satiation, that the pre-existent souls fell and resulted in this earthly life because they were satiated by the grace of God. They got to the point where they couldn't take any more. To me, that's more curious because, again, it betrays a philosophical understanding of perfection which doesn't allow for 
a dynamic state of growth. Philosophical perfection means stasis, no movement. Christian perfection is dynamic. We saw it already in Irenaeus of Leon and others. There is constant growth in God to infinity. There's no end to it. That's why there's no satiation. You can't be sated of the grace of God. It's a logical explanation that Origen came up with. But I will say another thing about Origen, that if you read him, you'll see how many times he says, perhaps, and maybe, and I think this, I stand to be corrected. That also has to be borne in mind. As I said, the questions that he asked, which others took up, and the points that he made, how many times you see a subtle but significant correction of a point originally made by Origen. That's why it's a difficult chapter, controversial, never easy. Origen deserves a lot of attention, but ultimately it's in order to see the good that Athanasius, the Cappadocians, Chrysostom and the others took from him and built on. The question of speculation versus revelation is a difficult one. It may not be satisfactory, but it's easier to answer in a general way that you see more of an intellectualistic approach in origin, which is therefore characterized by philosophical speculation and with somebody like Baesius, for example, St. Silwan says something that's very helpful. He says he could tell when the person writing was writing from direct personal experience, when he was writing on the basis of something that he had learned from others, writings of the fathers or from something from scripture, he could tell the difference. And when the person in question was giving his own opinion. And St. Paul does that sometimes. He says, now I'm giving you my opinion. This is not directly from God. This is my opinion. So those three levels. Now with Origen, with Clement, to a lesser degree, I think, you have an intellectual approach. In other words, it's the difference between something Father Sofrani used to say, if you ask me a question, I have a choice. I could answer you in one of two ways. I could answer you directly on the basis of my thoughts, on the basis of my knowledge, on the basis of my experience. I could say, I wouldn't say, but it would be implied, you know, I've studied theology, I received so many degrees, I know this, I know that. Yeah, I could answer your question. Here it is, right? This is my answer. Or I could say, before I answer you, Lord, give me an answer. Give me a word. Give me a word for your servant. Enlighten me. Help me. And then answer. So one is characterized by thinking, and the other is characterized by praying. It's the product of prayer. That's why it's a difficult question to answer. But when we read Origen, generally speaking, you can see that there are elements that come from the world around him. He himself is thinking, speculating, wondering perhaps this, perhaps that. When Paisios or when Siloan speaks, he doesn't say perhaps. He says, we know. We know the greater the love, the greater the suffering. We know. How do we know? He knows. He has lived this. There was a man, a doctor. He visited Paisios. He knew St. Paisios 
Uh, he was a doctor at a hospital that had to make a decision to buy a large piece of medical equipment. That cost a lot of money. And he could choose one of two options, and he didn't know which one to choose. And it came to him, I'm going to ask Basius. And he went to Basius to ask him about medical equipment. And the doctor himself, I mean, it's amazing that he thought of going to Basius anyway, but he did, and he expected Basius to say, oh, choose this one. You know what Basius did? He said to him, if you choose this one, you'll be able to do this, this, and this with that one, and sometimes you can combine it with something else as well. If you choose the other one, you'll be able to do this, this, and this with that, and it can do this and that. Uh, the doctor was amazed because he answered him both as a doctor and also as a, an engineer of these machines. Just to give you an example of the knowledge that God gives when it's necessary. Man cannot live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The word that proceeds from the mouth of God is sufficient. If we have that, of course, we have to live on that level. But if we have that, that's it. So we don't want to be judgmental, but we say that in the approach of origin, we find an intellectualistic approach which differs from the writings of the fathers. Click on the join button below our video and become a friend or reader of the Mount Tabor Academy. Support our drive to introduce the theology and spiritual life of the Orthodox Church to the wider community. Thank you.